new organization that is dedicated to saving America. NBC does not stand for Federal Election Commission. It's for state, education, and commerce, the foundations of this country, freedom. Um, so what better way to start off our real, you know, our real involvement in the conservative movement than with Pastor Pulaski. Just a little bit about me. I've been a conservative. I don't like to use the right activist because I don't like, that's not really what I do. I kind of do everything. But I'm more an actionist. I like to do things. You know, just talking isn't enough. We have to be doing things. Active is fine. Action is what gets things done. And action is what's going to save this country. I've been doing it for about 12 years. Started out with the Tea Party. Saw there was a problem. I had no idea what I was doing. Literally, I was like, saw a problem, just like many of you probably have, and said, how do I get involved? 12 years later, I'm bringing this amazing pastor on tour in America. Many of you know Pastor Pelosi from the viral video that occurred right after Easter, where he commanded uh, the police. I, I'm not even going to try to say it the way you say it. Gestapo. The Gestapo. <laughs> From the from the video, but then you probably heard about him after when they followed him. They did not have the courage to, or the I won't use the word because I'm in the presence of a pastor. The, <laughs> well, you know, there you go. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. There you go. I always have support in the audience. I love it. Uh, they didn't have those to um, to take him from his pulpit because they knew they know they know it's wrong. So what did they do? They followed him home and they arrested him in the middle of a freeway. And so you probably saw him, do, you saw that happen. And that was a few weeks, that was a couple months ago. And we came together just, again, it's God. It is literally God. And so I am, I'm not going to take up, you didn't come here to listen to me talk. So I'm just going to go ahead and hand the mic over to the pastor. But I just want to say this really quickly. We definitely, go to fbcunited.com. The pastor is on a 10-day uh, tour, I think is how long right now. I, we, it may be a little bit longer, depending on the response. And I'm going to tell you the response has been overwhelming. I just put four more dates today. So we are back, back. I hope you're ready to work, I know you are. But, um, but if you go to NBC United, you can help support not only the tour, but also the pastor's legal fund. So he, he's pretty much set as far as the stuff that happened, but he is going to sue them. And we all know that <laughs> it costs a lot of money. So we need your support, um, and everything that goes above and beyond the expenses is going to go to his legal fund. So without further ado, again, you can come here to listen to me. I know. So, Pastor, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. I'll move it here because the American flag is flapping. There's one thing I'm not going to tell you today. I'm not going to tell you, get out, because I want you to stay. <laughs> you know, now when I'm preaching in different churches, in different venues, I am worried a little bit that people will start following my example. And in the middle of my preaching, they will say, hey, you're talking too long. Too long, get out. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. It didn't happen yet, so I hope it will never happen. I'm very privileged to like that will be but yeah okay so i'm very grateful for this opportunity thank you so much for having me in i mean it's uh, america usa the american dream people here since we came with my son nathaniel we have been treated like royalties, and I'm telling you, if you would talk to my wife, you would know, don't do that. <laughs> Art Pulaski is not a perfect man, and if you don't believe me, call her, she's going to give you a big list. <laughs> I always tell people, you know, you think I'm special, talk to my wife, she will tell you I'm not. <laughs> I have two bosses. One is God, Amen. 
And he's my father, but he's also a king, king of kings and lord of lords. Amen. And I fear him in a good way. And I have a second boss, that's my wife. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I am afraid from time to time because the worst thing that can happen to a man is to go to bed, to fall asleep with an enemy. <laughs> I'm terrified because you don't know what the enemy will do to you. You're sleeping. So we have to be vigilant. So what I decided to do a long time ago, I, my wife is my be best friend, and I listen. At least I do my best to listen. So now you got all the dirt from the family, if you will. So let me pray. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Father, for everyone that is hearing this. I pray, Father, that you would give us the courage, the boldness, the passion to do what's right. And it's always right to do what's right. Father, we have forgotten that you have died for our freedom. And no man has that right to take that freedom away from us. And Father, I pray that we will rise up like a pride of lions that will come together and will take what rightfully belongs to us, the savannah, the kingship that you have given to your creation, to the crown. So Holy Spirit, I welcome you here in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. I want to start with a quote that really touched my heart. And here is what it says. Every man gives his life for what he believes. Every woman gives her life for what she believes. Sometimes people believe in little or nothing, and so they give their lives to little or nothing. One life is all we have, and we live it as we believe in living. And then it's gone. The words, those words, came from the mouth of a young girl that was willing rather to die than to bow before the wishes of the tyrants. Her name was Joan of Arc. A young lady, a young girl, a teenager, that as you know from the history, she led an army against tyrants because she believed that her country needed, her people needed to be free. And right now when I'm looking around, I wish I would see women and men like her that would rise up and stand up and fight. Unfortunately, for too long, for over a year, what I see, actually decades, because this whole thing didn't start at yesterday. It did not start at last March or with the Wuhan Chinese virus. It didn't start at then. It started decades ago. When the men have forgotten, they have forgotten what is their job, to be protectors, to be fighters, to be providers, to be hunters, to be everything that God intended men to be, to be men. And the women have forgotten that when the family is out of balance, when a woman is not allowing a man to be men, everything becomes upside down. And that's exactly what happened in our Western countries. Women want to be men, and men want to be women. I remember years ago, we were asked by the reporters to spend a week with us. And usually, my wife never gives interviews. She is just she says, that's your job. She always says to me, if, if they would only pay you for speaking, we would be very wealthy. <laughs> but actually, it's the opposite. Every time I open my mouth, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so I guess many people have all kinds of anointings and all kinds of gifts. And my gift is to tick people off. <laughs> and I talk to God from time to time. And I said, God. You know, I hear some people, and they're so amazing. They're such a beautiful singers, and they have so many talents. And why you didn't give me one of those talents? You had to give me the one that every time I'll do something or say something, I have a lineup of enemies <laughs> trying to destroy me. Right now, as we speak, Antifa is advocating with the government of Canada to arrest me here in the United States. <laughs> So imagine how much terrified they are. So here's what I'm telling, telling to you. It looks like we, what we're doing is working because they're terrified. They are afraid. They are afraid. They're terrified. When an enemy arrests pastors in the middle of a highway, 
When an enemy arrests political opponents, that means what we are doing, it's working, because they started to be terrified, terrified of the truth. And here is what God told me recently about the truth. He says, the truth is like a pillar. It doesn't need any support. But the lie, a lie needs a support of another lie. A lie needs manipulation, terror, fear. And that's not what we are seeing every single day. You open the TV and you see terror, you see fear, threats, lies, manipulations. We don't have mainstream media anymore, we have mainstream propaganda. And that's what we have. And let's call it what it is. If Goebbels, the minister for propaganda for Adolf Hitler, was alive today, he would be very proud of what the Western civilization has accomplished. They have been bought, they have sold their souls to the devil. You know, as I observe the reporters, I can't, I can't but ask myself a question every single time. Don't they know? Are they okay with selling their own souls? Don't they, do they not know that one day they're going to die? It's just a matter of when, not if. And you see, here is a surprise maybe for you. One day you're going to die and you're going to stand before my God and you will give an account to, for what you did and for what you said. Every single man on this side of eternity is going to face the judge of judges. You see those judges right now, they're passing the laws, they're persecuting us. I faced over 300 tickets, dozen arrests, over 100 court cases. Right now I got 29 tickets, two court orders, two injunctions and two contempts of court. Right now. I was arrested in the middle of the highway because the judge gave them enormous powers against the criminal code of Canada. The judge allowed them to come into a church anytime they want, any day of the week, with whomever they want. So they showed up with the SWAT team. I have no record of violence, uttering threats, or assaults. I've never been charged with assault. And yet they chose to use SWAT team, anti-terrorists, to come to a peaceful assembly to terrorize people that are praying. They're not doing anything illegal. They're not doing anything bad. They're not selling drugs. They're not planning another terrorist attack or where are we going to put the bomb. A group of people that is just praying and worshiping their God. A group of people that say to the government, we just want to be left alone, leave us be. And they came with a SWAT team. That tells me they're afraid. That tells me that my words are more powerful than their guns and their weapons. Is that not, is that not the story of your president? Because this person is not the president, the President Trump is that not the story of the President Trump? That's right. yeah. Every time. Every time he opened his mouth, he terrified the enemy. Amen. Every time he said something, it brought a terror in the hearts of the liars. Yes. Because he confronted the liars. He confronted the lie. He said what was on his heart. Oh, I miss people like that. Here, this young lady said, I'm not afraid. I am not afraid, this young girl said to you and me, and she's still speaking to you and me, through generations, she says, I am not afraid, I was born to do this. How many of you can say that? How many of you are willing to stand up and say, I was born for such a time as this, just like Esther was? Yes. Just like Esther was. Yes. We read about the heroes from the past. You know, yesterday I was privileged to stand at the very place where Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous speech, I have a dream. I stood at the same location where man, one man, was willing to die for what he believed in. Yes. And I can't help but to look around and ask this simple question, where are you, man? Where are you, Martin Luther King Jr.? Where are you today? Every generation is facing challenges. Every generation needs heroes 
When I read the Bible, this is what I see. I see heroes from the past speaking to me today. And here is what they're saying. Art, will you stand up? Will you pay the price? Will you do what's right? Because it's always the right thing to do what's right. Will you go? In the Bible, God is walking around, and there is this powerful scripture, and it says, whom are we going to use? God is looking for a man again, just like he looked for Adam and Eve. Remember the story at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis? It says, Adam, where art thou? Eve, where art thou? God is looking for a man. He's looking for a woman, and he says the same thing to you and to me every single day. Where are you? I want to use you. I want you to be my hands and my feet. I want you to go and give people hope because what those people lost in the past 15 months, in the past decades actually, why those young people are turning into drugs and alcohol, why do you think they are committing suicide, why we have such a huge mess in our societies? Because they are looking for hope. But there's not enough people that are willing to give them that hope. In the Bible, from the very beginning to the end, I encounter people that stood tall in the face of the opposition. You look at the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When they were told to bow, I see so many people bowing right now. Bow before the masks. Bow before the medical tyranny. Bow before physical distancing. Since when? Since when? We are to separate from each other. What kind of society it would be, it would become when the people will not have contact with each other. When the children will grow up and they will fear themselves. They will treat another human being as a disease, as a virus. Stay away, stay away, stay away. Only a sick society would allow something like that. So the question is this, are you willing to be Peter? Are you willing to be this lady, John of Arc? Are you willing to be Martin Luther King Jr., a person like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that is willing to stand up and say, oh, king, we want you to know that we are the stand that there is a law that you have passed. And the law is very clear, and it says bow or else. Bow or we will give you tickets. Bow or we will arrest you. Bow or we will come after your belongings. Come or we will take your children away. Bow or else. And yet they look at this and they were not just facing a ticket. They were facing a punishment, a death by fire, a furnace filled with fire. And yet they said, oh, great king, we want you to know that we will not bow before your idol, Amen. the golden image. We want you to know that God is perfectly capable of saving us, but even if he will choose not to, we will not bow. Amen. Yeah. We will not bow. We will not bow. There is this fascinating story of Daniel. Daniel was told that prayer is illegal. Do you know that in Canada, in Canada, to this day, prayer is illegal. What? Prayer is illegal, according to the Bible. I, I, mean, I mean, I can pray during Zoom chats. <laughs> I can hide behind the camera and I can pray like that. But my Bible is very clear. It says, is there anyone sick among you? Call out the elders, anoint them with oil, and pray. Lay hands on them and pray. And that is illegal. Do you know that in Canada for a long time, we were not allowed to sing in a church? Singing in a church was spreading virus. And yet you can go to Costco, you can go to Ikea. In Ikea, I took my son over there. He needed a bed, so we went. I mean, there was nowhere else to go, so it's like a vacation in Ikea. <laughs> Because that's the only thing that was open outside of abortion clinics because they were open and they are still throughout of this craziness. Liquor stores and marijuana stores, they all were open and are still open to this day. So for entertainment purposes, 
we went to Ikea and only we went to buy something for him. And at the door, it says, only 480 people allowed. Only 480 people allowed. So I can bring my whole church and half of my neighborhood <laughs> to Ikea, and that's perfectly legal. And no one will be hunting me down. But I cannot bring one person into my church because I will be arrested for inciting people to come to church and preaching from the pulpit. When you see stuff like this, you know that you know this has nothing to do with the virus. This has nothing to do with health. But this whole thing has everything to do with tyranny yes. and control and manipulation yes. and lies. And Daniel understood that the order, the command of the government at that time was illegal. Illegal according to God. He was told, you're not allowed to pray for 30 days. Remember the story? Yes. Daniel was a very powerful man. He was a politician. And yet he chooses, he chooses not to obey the command, a direct command from Biden. He says, I cannot obey such an order. Why? Because this order is coming from the pit of hell. This order comes from the devil. And good people do not obey the orders of the tyrants. If you do, you are partaking in their evil. You're part of the problem. You're part of evil. When you're submitting, when you're not fighting, when you're not pushing the evil away, you're part of the problem. Yes. Daniel learns about the law, evil law, and goes to his house. And he opens the windows for all to see. For all to see. And he goes to his knees and he prays. And he's not shutting down his doors because we know the story. And we know that those people that accused him before the king went and saw that he was praying. He was not hiding. He was openly defying the laws that were illegal, evil. Amen. I have been accused of being a lawbreaker. I have been accused of being troublemaker. I have been accused of not following Romans 13. Let me just give you a little bit of Romans 13. Romans 13 is for, for the evil, for the government, the authority, the structure that has a sword, it says, for those that are doing evil. Evil people should fear authority. Evil people should fear the police, not good people. Good people should be rewarded by the police. Good people should be rewarded by the government. So when you see a government that is punishing the good but is rewarding the evil, you know that you know that you cannot obey that kind of authority. And if you as a Christian do not understand that, then you're delusional. Yeah. <laughs> then there's something wrong with you and your theology. Because God cannot bless evil. And God cannot bless an evildoer. He punishes evil. Why? Because he hates evil. Why he hates evil? Because he loves you. And when he sees evil being done to you, his heart is broken because he loves you. See, ultimately, love desires to do good. I have three children. One of them is here. If you come and you want to hurt him, you're dead meat. I'll do everything in my power to stop you. Because my heart, the love that I have for my children, for my son, is bigger than my own life. If I had a choice right now, him or me, I'll gladly say, take me now so he can live. That's my love. So imagine the love of the father that is perfect. My love is tinted with sin. It's not perfect. I'm imperfect sinner saved by grace. But God is a holy God. And he loves you so much that he died on that cross. He rose from the grave. And he hates anyone that touches you and hurts you. And there's lots of people in government right now that are hurting people. Yes. They're telling the children to wear a muzzle like a dog. Yeah. They're telling people to put something in their system that is not even a real deal. I'm not going to say it because those devils will deplatform you. That's what they do. The government is destroying 
the next generation. Why? I studied, I studied history and I studied slavery. Here is what the muzzle means. The muzzle says to you, you have no identity. You have no name. You have no face. You're nobody. We don't care about you. And we are telling you, you're nothing. You're nobody. You have no identity. And then there is another message that says you have no voice. We don't want to hear anything from you. We don't care what you have to say. We're telling you, you are a slave. Mm. Faceless, nameless, nobody that no one wants to hear. Because we know that we know that even if this virus was as deadly as they say it is, which we know now, 15 months later, that it's not, we know that a piece of cloth cannot stop a virus that is 1,000 times smaller than a bacteria. It cannot happen. I don't care how you can wear four of them, 20 of them. It's not possible to stop that. So when you know the real science, when you know the real biology, when you know the real you know, medical aspect of things, you know that there's something very sinister that is going on here. So what is going on? Why do they hate us so much? Let me give you a little bit of history. I grew up behind the Iron Curtain, under the boots of the Soviets, and in a peculiar country, Poland. My grandfather escaped Siberia, and my grandma with my great uncle escaped from the Russian prison before the Second War, during the Second War. And they escaped, my grandfather escaped, and then my grandma and they met and they got married and here I am. And here he is. <laughs> That's a little biology. I heard since I was little the stories of the Nazis, the stories of the Gestapo. My grandma was hiding under the bed when the SS were raping other children. My grandparents were telling me stories of death and torture and SS coming and Gestapo doing all kinds of different things. I grew up in a city called Knurów where we had a concentration camp that was built by the Nazis. Every year we would go to Auschwitz-Birkenau as a reminder to us, as a reminder to see over and over again what a man is capable of when you don't put a check to his power. Because what I know about evil is this, evil will never stop doing evil. Evil needs to be stopped. What I know about the bullies, that they will keep bullying until you say to them three words. I mean, and this is the phenomenal aspect of what I did. I mean, people say to me, do you feel like a hero? No, I don't. I just did what I believe every pastor should be doing. Amen. Yeah. I did what every priest, what every priest yes. is supposed to be doing. Yes. Every rabbi, yes. every politician, yes. every restaurant owner, yes. every father, every mother. Yes. What did I do? What did I do? I've told them three words if you summarize the whole thing. And I've done it not just during that Easter weekend that was our Passover the holiest time for Christians that was the time of our Lord's death and resurrection and they dared to came with their fascist boots into the church I had only one thing for them actually three words no you're not allowed to do this I'm stopping you you can't no no and get out get out what it takes what it takes to be considered a hero of faith in a Bible, what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, they just said no. You want us to bow, and we are just telling you, oh great king, you have the power to murder us. Yes, you have that power. You got more guns than us. You've got the badges. You've got the government. You've got the soldiers. Yes, you can shoot us dead. Yes, you can do that. But I'm still going to say to you no. Amen. No. And that's what they did. And because they did it, they end up in a fire furnace. But I want to tell you something that is, I, I think it's the most fascinating part of that story. That when they said no and they faced the punishment, 
Someone showed up. God showed up in the middle. Right now, we have entered an era when we do what God tells us to do, and we see him showing up. And when God shows up, it's over for the enemy. Amen. When God comes, it's over for the fascists. It's over for the Gestapo. Woo! When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to the fire, those that threw them into the fire died, and Jesus shows up. And the king is looking at this and says, like, I thought we threw three people in, but now I see four. You see, he, here is the story of my life. They look at me and they cannot comprehend how come I am still alive. How come I can feed thousands of people without a big support of corporations and governments and money? How come their people are coming to the kingdom of God and we baptize them every single way? How come there are healings of cancer and aneurysm and people are being raised from the wheelchairs? How come, even though they're crushing us and beating us down and giving us tickets after tickets, how come we're still there? I remember police would come to me and say, how are you doing this? I, I, we, we are puzzled. The police department came to me and they said, we have this one question. How can you afford all of that? How, how are you doing it? And I would point at the name that we always have at our church, and it says Jesus. I said, Amen. ask him. He knows. He knows. Because if I was to do this by myself, I would quit quit long time ago because I'm not capable of that kind of a sacrifice. I believe that Daniel was not capable of just dying just because he prayed. I think that came from God, the desire to do what's right. You see, what we need in our society, we need to go back to the word of God. We need to go back to Jesus. We need to have the desire to do what pleases God, not what pleases Biden. Yes. Not What pleases Biden and his minions like Clintons and Husseins, Obama, uh, abominations and all those different people, what pleases them is you being dead or enslaved. That's what pleases them. They're living in their palaces, they got unlimited resources, they got their titles, and they look at you and they say, you have no name, you're just a number to pay taxes, for us, you have no identity, and you have no say. Why? Because we say so. And that's the story from the very beginning. That's the story of the devil. The devil that is pillaging, stealing, lying, cheating, and is coming for you today. Just like he did for those boys all those years ago. This lady fascinates me because she was called the Maid of Orleans. She was born circa 1412 on the 30th May of 1431. She became a national heroine of France. She was a peasant girl that acted under divine guidance, led at the age of 17 the French army in a momentous victory at Orleans. In 1429, they repulsed an English attempt to conquer France during the Hundred Years' War. After she defeated the English at the Battle of Patay, and Jean brought Charles of France, where he was officially crowned King Charles VII on July 17th. I'm reading those stories from the past. I'm reading the stories from those heroes, those heroes that understood that there is a time in your life, in everybody's life, that you're being required to pay the price. So let me just talk about this for a second. If cost the Father, the Father that is in heaven, the creator of heavens and the earth, the Alpha and Omega, then the beginning and the end, if cost him his son, and if cost his son his own life, his own blood, do you really think it's not going to cost you anything? Do you really think that Christianity is a kumbaya, 
putting a toonie and asking for another chocolate bar? Do you really think that this is Christianity? While what I read, not just in the Bible, but through the history, where Christians were burned on the stakes and cut in half and crucified and thrown into the lions. And we somehow, in a Western civilization, we think that it's over. Now we can just pew warm, giving a tunny, asking God for more. I remember one time God spoke to me, and this is what he said. He says, oh, I wish that my children would come to me not just begging and asking for more. I have given them everything. I have given them my blood. I have given them my son. I have given them salvation. I have given them healing. I have given them all the blessings, and I have created a paradise for them. And they constantly are not satisfied. They want more and more and more. I want another car. I want this job. I want this. I want that. I want that. And he hears all those words. But this is what he said. I wish that one day they would come to me and he would, they would say, Father, what I can do for you. You've done so much for me. What I can do for you today. Amen. What do you want me to do? God says in his word that he's looking for someone that is willing to go. He's walking around and he's looking. He's asking you, will you go for us? Will you do what's right? Will you stand for righteousness? And this prophet of old stood up before God and said those few words. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Here I am, Lord. Use me. Are you available for God? Are you willing to be used? This girl was willing to die. She was willing to die for what she believed in. She says, act and God will act. Amazing. But to surrender who you are and to live without belief is more terrible than dying. Even more terrible than dying young. Let me read it again. But to surrender who you are. Have we not surrendered who we are? Forget about Christianity for a second. Have you not surrendered your identity, identity, who you are, your face, your name? Have you not bowed before those devils just because they said to you, bow? Everything you stood for, everything you believed, you just give it to them just because you were terrified of the penalties. And I get it. I understand that penalties are horrible. I got millions of dollars in penalties as we speak. But you don't see me depressed. You don't see me terrified. Amen. You're not seeing me bowing. So how can I surrender... Everything I believe in. But to surrender who you are and to live without belief is more terrible than dying, even more terrible than dying young. I would rather die than do something which I know to be a sin or to be against God's will. I place, place trust in God, my creator. In all things, I love him with all my heart. We've lost that in the church. We've lost that in the society. Let me give you a little bit of a history. Do you know why this land was called the New World? They call it the New World because they were persecuted in Europe. You know that? The pilgrims came here because they were sick and tired of persecution out there. They were murdered. They were burned on stakes. They were cut in half. Their heads were chopped. And they wanted to be free. I emigrated to North America, to Canada, for one purpose, not for money. I had good business in Greece. That was my El Dorado. I came to Canada for one purpose and one purpose only, for freedom. I wanted to be a free man. Free man. Everyone should be free. We have been born to be free. And the moment we are born, they are enslaving us for the purpose of control and manipulation. Right. Nothing is holy for them. So those people, hundreds of years ago, they emigrated, they escaped the persecution, and they came here for freedom. 
freedom to be who you want to be, to work hard, to achieve something, to have children and grandchildren, and to pass the blessings to the next generations. What they are robbing us today from is the blessings that we have put in the storage for the next generation. Yes. And I say to the older generation this, you don't want to fight for yourself, fine, I get it. You know, your times, you know, your days are numbered maybe. You don't feel the strength, you don't want to pay the price for your own sake. You think, well, I'm not really doing anything anymore. I get that, but do it for your children. Fight for your grandchildren. You don't want to do it for yourself, I get that, fine. Don't fight for them. What kind of future are we going to leave to them? What kind of heritage we're going to pass to the next generation? Muzzled on a leash? This is the future that you want to have for your children? I grew up in a country like this. Hearing the stories for years, what the Nazis did to my grandparents, to my country. You know, I grew up in a country we still had the bullet holes from the Nazi era. We were playing in the bunkers in a concentration camp in my city. We heard the stories over and over, over and over. People are asking me questions, why do you call those nice officers Nazis? Why do you call them Gestapo? Why do you call them communists, fascists, socialists, and whatever comes to my mind from that crazy time. Why? Because they're acting like fascists, they're acting like terrorists. If you act like a fascist, I'll call you a fascist. And I said that to the officers many times. I have a hard time to call them officers anymore. I call them gangsters in uniform. Because they're acting like gangsters. You see, in Canada, we have a criminal code that protects our rights. And also, we have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And the preamble, it says very clearly, this is what it says, where is Canada? acknowledges the supremacy of God and the rule of law. God is out the window. They kicked him a long time ago, and there is no more rule of law. They do whatever they want, and that's fascism. Right. Hitler did everything according to the law, you know that? He passed laws, but they were his laws. Those were laws against people. They were laws against the Constitution. They were laws against the German people. You know who was the first victim of Adolf Hitler? The Germans. You gotta remember the first victims of the Nazi party under the Adolf Hitler, the devil, were his own people. What they're doing to us, what they're doing to you, you are the first victims of those people. If we don't stop them now, if you don't rise up here in America, if you will not say, like I said, no, and get out, you will not have a future. Because those people will never stop. The Bidens, the Clintons, the Fauci's, whatever you want to call them. I mean, I, there is a huge list of very wicked, evil people. You know them by names. But here is what she said. King of England and you, Duke of Bedford, who call yourself regent of the kingdom of France. Or you're Biden, who call yourself the president of the United States of America. Settle your debt to the king of heaven. Amen. This guy is one leg outside of this eternity. Yes. And he still is sinning against the king of kings. Right. He still right. shakes his fist towards heavens, right. continuing in his sin. Right. I'm thinking to myself, don't you know, you fool, really? that you can be and have the biggest title on this planet, and you have absolutely nothing. You can be the richest man on the planet Earth, and you have absolutely nothing, because you cannot take that with you. The guy doesn't even remember his own name. But he is lifting his fist towards heaven. Unbelievable. Remember, settle your debt Biden, to the king of heaven, return to the maiden who is envoy of the king of heaven, the keys to all the good towns you took and violated in France. 
What a boldness. What a courage. Courage of a young girl that was willing to say in the face of the evil, you are evil. How many of us have that kind of courage to name evil, evil? <laughs> say what you see. When they came, this whole craziness started in March. I mean, they persecuted me for many years before. I was the first Canadian clergyman to be arrested for publicly reading Bible. I was arrested, handcuffed, forced to walk backwards, and I faced a year of jail for my horrible crime to read the Bible, Psalms to be exact, to six parishioners, no amplification, just to, to ourselves. They brutally arrested me and I faced a year. I had seven criminal charges. I won, but that started a 10 year old fight with those evil people. And I decided that if they have engaged in this fight, they have forgotten one thing, that people, Polish people, Polish Christians do not bow. We do not bow before the evil. We fought with the Ottoman Empire. We fought with the Hussars. The Hussars were for 200 years unbeatable army, the best soldiers ever. We fought with the Nazis, the Russians, the communists. We stopped the Vikings. See, Polish people are peculiar people. Yes. <laughs> if there is no common enemy, we fight with each other. I think for training purposes. Because I cannot explain any other way. Why are you fighting, you people? The enemy is not here. Just enjoy life. So I, the only thing that comes to my mind is like, it's a practice. They just constantly need to practice to be good. But when they have a common enemy, my God, enemy, start running. Start running. Because we will never quit. We will never stop. I remember I had a meeting with the chief of police. And he says to me, what are we going to do with you? And I said to him, oh, no, 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 no. What are we going to do with you? Yeah. <laughs> you see, you got to remember that I am an ambassador of the living God. Amen. I am an ambassador of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. I do not serve just the church. I serve God. Amen. He is giving me tickets after tickets. And I said to him, you know, they threatened me with millions of dollars worth of tickets. And I said to him, why not a billion? <laughs> At this time, I mean, those numbers mean absolutely nothing. <laughs> Give me a billion so I can be the first man on earth with a ticket worth a billion dollars. <laughs> why not? You, you know what I mean? Like, if you're playing this game, let's play big. <laughs> And I look into his eyes, and the media was there, and they were recording, and I said, listen, man, you don't understand the Polish people. And I look into his eyes, and I said, you have to kill me. Are you ready to kill me? Because I'm never going to stop. You can give me ticket after ticket. I mean, I have about 300 of them. Can you match that? <laughs> his chief of police that was before him gave me a 300. He just gave me 29. Oh, oh slacker, you have so... <laughs> much to learn from the previous guy. <laughs> you see, here is what I saw in his eyes. He looked at me and he looked deep. And I think he realized, seriously, there is no stopping that guy. We would really have to kill him. Yeah. Now imagine if every person would have such a conviction. If every pastor would say, shoot me dead, arrest me, but I'm opening the church. If every priest would come and say, you know what? I serve the king of kings, and Biden, you're not that king. It would be over. She continues and she says, since God had commanded it. What is the commandments of God? Who do I serve? Do I serve you? Or do I serve God? I always say to my parishioners, the people that come to our church, I always remind them from time to time, and some people do not understand why I am so brutal with them. But this is what I say, don't you ever think I work for you. I don't work for you. You don't pay me. You don't owe me. I'm a free man. I was a slave, but now I'm free. And I will not allow any man to put me into bondage. 
You see, when I was arrested with my brother, they put chains on my feet, but I was a free man. I was freer than the jailers. You can put my body in chains. You can shoot it dead, but I will still be free, no matter what. Since God had commanded, what, this is what he said, do not forsake. Do not. Do not. Is that a suggestion? No. Do not forget the gathering of the saints. Yes. Do not. Come together. Why do we need to come together? Because that's where we get strength. That's where we have protection from. We come together because family comes together. Family is not separated. Family, you cannot say, I mean, maybe this will be a shocker for you, but let me educate you, your children, a little bit. Do you know that you cannot have children using Zoom chats? <laughs> is that a shock to you? Simple biology is not going to happen no matter how long you're going to try. It's not going to happen. God designed us in a certain way. For us to come together and to be together. Yeah. Because he wants to have a relationship with his creation. And he wants his creation to have a relationship with the creation. Amen. That's why he didn't separate Adam and Eve and gave them a Zoom chat video. <laughs> because if that happened, we would never be here. We would never have a Biden as a devil ruling <laughs> over this country. It would never exist. The commandment is very clear. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Do not forsake the gatherings of the saints. Lay hands on the sick. Call out elders. Anoint them. Anoint them with oil and pray and they shall recover. Feed the poor. How can I feed the poor using Zoom chats? I mean, if you think that's possible, give me all of your money and your possessions and I will give them back to you using Zoom chats. I'll do my best. I promise. Since God had commanded, it was necessary that I do it, she says. A young kid. So much wisdom. Such a courage. Since God commanded it, even if I had a hundred fathers and mothers, even if I had been a king's daughter, I would have gone nevertheless. In other words, this is what she said. I would do it anyway. No matter what. No matter the circumstances. I would do because God commanded me to do something. In the book of Acts, chapter 4 and 5, a powerful story. A powerful story. A story of courage of apostles. The government came to them and said, we are forbidding you to preach in the name of Jesus Christ. This is the law. Oh, how many times in the past 15 months I've heard this? This is the law. This is the law. This is the law. Wear a muzzle. Be a good puppy. Be a good slave. This is the law or else. You know what? I've tried something. I encourage you to do the same. I tried to put the muzzle on a free dog. I almost lost my arm. <laughs> you see, the dogs are smarter than people. I mean, is that not fascinating? That the animals have become wiser than humans these days. And we call ourselves an educated, sophisticated, 21st century, you know, enlightened or whatever. We have become dumber than dumb. Yeah. I mean, have you ever watched the movie Dumb and Dumber? Yes. Just don't follow their examples. Yeah. Exactly. Because you will be eaten. Yeah. The judge came during secret meeting and he gave them the power to come to our church any time, any day, with whomever they wish. And they said, he said, and behold, his name is David Gates. The judge's name is Gates in Calgary. And he said, if you dare to oppose them, if you will say a word stopping them, then the officers can arrest you using any form they deem necessary. 
and they can arrest you anywhere you are. That means you don't need a warrant anymore. I could be arrested in a restaurant, in a car, in my office, during the night hours, any time of the day, anywhere. That's the power this judge has given to them. Another judge gave them even more powers. That's why the pastors are being arrested left and right. My friend, two days ago, a pastor, Tim's, got arrested again in front of his seven children. And the children were crying, daddy, daddy. I mean, it was heartbreaking. My son was playing this, and I said, stop it. I, I, can't watch, I cannot watch this. I, I just want to go back there and start doing stuff that is very ungodly. I can't watch this. This is too emotional. Who are those people? Who are... Who, who are those officers? Don't they have a heart? Don't they see what's really going on? Is their salary that important to sell their soul to the devil? I remember I watched the documentary, of course, being Polish. I watched all of the documentaries from the Second War and the communism and all that stuff. And I remember this SS person being interviewed after the war. He spent a few years in jail for his crimes. And the reporter asked him a simple question. Officer, sir, what you were thinking when you were pulling the, the trigger, when you were shooting the mother holding a baby, like what was in your head? He really wanted to know what this man was thinking when he did this job, because this is what I hear over and over again. I'm just doing my job. No, you're not. That's not your job. Your job is to serve and protect. Amen. That's not your job, officer. You have forgotten what your job is. You have walked away from your mandate. You're spitting at your in uniform and on your badge. You're not doing your job. That's the problem. He was the answer from that officer. He looked, for a second he was thinking, he says, nothing. And the reporter was puzzled, you were not thinking anything? No, I was not thinking anything. Uh, wait a second, I was thinking something. I was thinking to aim straight, so it's only one bullet. I don't know what to say. How far? They have walked to the other side. they shooting a baby and a mother. He has absolutely no emotions, no feelings. And he justifies this by, I was following orders. Yeah. I was just doing my job. That was my duty. And I did it. I did it because $5,000 a month. It's a good salary. I did it because they paid me double. 10,000 Canadian police, they got about $10,000 a month. And I'm thinking, keep your money, keep millions of dollars. I don't want them. I don't want the penny. I would prefer to be a homeless than to do your job. Because one day, one day you're going to face my judge. And eternity is not five years, it's not 50 years, it's not 100 years. Eternity is forever. And this is what she replied to her judge. And let me be able to reply to my judge that is hunting me down like a criminal for opening a church, for praying for people, for feeding the poor. You say that you are my judge. I don't know. I do not know if you are. But take good heed not to judge me ill because you would put yourself in great peril. In other words, be very careful what you're going to do with me because I'm telling you I'm a child of the living God Amen. and I'm not doing evil I'm doing good and when you persecute good you will face the judge of judges Amen. and the king of kings and the lord of lords yes. in the book of Acts the government was very clear very clear you see I am bombarded sometimes by cowardly churches and cowardly pastors oh, cowardly God. priests and this is what they would say, art, obey the law. Yeah. Just obey the law. Why can't you be like us? Well, you see, I don't want to be like you. <laughs> That's the thing. I don't want to be as far as I can run. I don't want to be like you. You're bloody cowards. 
You don't stand up for anything. You even don't stand up for what you have been preaching for the past 20, 30 years from the pulpit. You say your God is the God that moves the mountains. But you yourself are afraid to get a ticket. Is this pastor, we were renting a place from him. And one day he calls me. We were in the news and he calls me and says, Art, you're not allowed to come back to the church. I said, why? What happened? He says, well, they threatened me, the AHS, that's uh, Alberta Health Services, with a ticket. I said, excuse me? They threatened you with a ticket so you don't have, that means you don't have any tickets yet? I mean, I was shocked. I got 29. And you don't even have one? What have you been doing for the past 15 years? You might get a ticket. You might. He says, Art, you got to go. And he kicked us like a dog on the streets. And thank God that God is God. Because if I was God, I would wipe out all of the people. So I'm very grateful that God is God and is more merciful than me. Because I will have to wipe out myself as well. And God provided a bigger building. Twice as big. And we filled it within weeks. You see, that's what God is doing. What enemy meant for evil, God turns around for good. So now imagine Shadrach, Michigan, and Abednego are in the middle of the furnace. They're being purified by God. And they're being used as a testimony. Joseph was sold by his own family as a slave. 13 years he spent as a slave. Then in prison, falsely accused of a rape. Horrible life. Horrible circumstances. And I'm sure he had those moments like, God, why? What have I done? Why is this happening to me? If God could tell us why... We would not be whining and complaining. But 13 years later, Joseph becomes a symbol of freedom. God called him in the Bible a savior of nations. A savior of nations. Would you spend 13 years in slavery, in jail, falsely accused to be called a savior of nations? Amen. Would you get a ticket? To make a point, to stand up and say to the evil, stop, no, no more, enough, no more, get out, get out, get out, get out. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, you've heard that, right? Those were things that were reminded to me as we stood at the very place where Martin Luther King Jr. was telling, a reminding, I, I should say, reminding the world, what is this whole thing all about? And it's not about the titles. It's not about your houses. It's not about your bank accounts. It's not about who you know or where you spend your vacation. He reminded the people that this whole thing is about God and God's loss. Amen. God's justice. The politicians of today have forgotten. They have forgotten why people created this nation. What was the purpose? I'm not saying America was perfect. I'm not saying Canada was perfect. We are imperfect people. There is no such a thing as perfection. Only God is perfect. But they came here for a purpose. And the next generations, the generation of today have forgotten what was that purpose. A life without the purpose is a life of just existing. Like a white tail in the bushes. You're just existing. You were never called to just exist. You were called to do great and mighty exploits for God. He said also, I quoted that before, the time is always right to do what is right. True peace is not merely the absence of tension. Let me tell you something. When the SWAT team showed up a number of times, my record is 100 officers, 52 police cars, 20 police on bicycles, being videotaped, recorded in one church service. Because if I would combine all of those people, it would be thousands of them. 100 officers. So just imagine 
you're feeding the poor, and you see everywhere you turn, you see a police with a camera, intimidating, harassing. It started in March 2020, when the city hall sent me a letter and they said that I have to stop feeding the poor. How can I stop feeding the poor? How anyone can stop feeding the poor? And I said, no, I can't. How can I, being a pastor, how can I stop feeding the poor? I appealed it to the Minister of Justice. I appealed it to other people that I knew. They all ignored me. And then the next day, I had 12 officers, $1,200 ticket. I have been the first clergyman in Canada to get a COVID ticket. Wow. And then my parishioner was shafted, assaulted, and I was told, you will, be, uh, you will be arrested and you will get a million dollar ticket. And that started a fight that continued until December. They would come from time to time. They would videotape us. They would give me a ticket. They would use the intimidation tactics. You see, when you see a video during the Easter, you think like this pastor is crazy by calling them Nazis and Gestapo. But you don't understand the background story. You don't know that this was going on for a year, over a year. That they have been using the tactics of the Gestapo and KGB for over a year. They would come to our church and they would videotape us. And they would take pictures. And they would make sure that everyone sees that they are there and you're being filmed. You see, we're coming after you. We're coming after you. We're coming after the parishioners. We're coming after the volunteers. We're coming after you, pastors. We're not even hiding that we're coming after you. Because this is not about health. Because if this was about the health, they would say to us, here are the medals for feeding the poor. Yeah, right. Right. I end up with another COVID ticket. I think the culmination of the story was December, when the provincial, federal, and municipal government declared that they're canceling Christmas. I mean, who do you think you are? Wow. How dare you, people? Who are you? You're canceling Christmas? I'm canceling you. Yeah. That's what I said to them. I went public. I did a video. It was, went viral too. And I said, I'm canceling you devils, you politicians. Yeah. You're not canceling the Christmas. I am inviting the whole country to the biggest Christmas celebration ever. Yeah. And the people showed up. People came. The brave came. Because when a lion roars, other lions are attracted. Yeah. We have to form the biggest pride of lions they have ever seen in the history of this world. Yes. yes, they punished me. We had hundreds of gifts for the homeless, and we had AAA stakes, and it was amazing. We had carolers, we had preachers, we had testimonies. It was a great day, but I end up with 11 tickets for that day. <laughs> 11 COVID tickets. I mean, charges that I don't even know existed. I think they're make, making up stories. I think they're going through their Bible and say, how can we hammer this guy? What evil did he do? Oh, he fed the poor. Let's hammer him with that. Oh, he was singing and was illegal at that time to sing. Let's hammer him with that. Oh, he preached without wearing a muzzle. Bad dog, bad dog, bad dog, another ticket. So that was in the outdoors. That street church. But I was kind of happy, not happy that they were hammering me on the streets, but I was happy that they didn't come to the building. Mm. Because I run two churches. In the building I teach, and it's extremely difficult to teach history and theology when I'm distracted by armed forces and health inspectors and all those devils. You know, the one thing you don't want in a church is the devil sitting in the front row. Amen. That's why we cast out the devils. And we cast out the demons so they would go. Yes. Yes. Cleansing the temple. Cleansing the temple. Yes. One day I'm coming to open the church and what do I see? I see police and I say, oh no. Here we go again. They blocked our entry to the church. They blocked it. I went to talk to them and behold, the police officers were Brits. I'm not picking on Britain, okay? Don't get me wrong. But I find it fascinating that those that are hunting us down are foreigners. Yeah. They're not Canadians. Yeah. They are foreigners, just like me. Why did I come to Canada? Why did I emigrate there? Because I wanted to be free. I didn't want to bring communists to Canada. I escaped communism. That's why I went 
to Canada. But it looks like those people are escaping garbage that they have in Great Britain, and they're bringing that garbage with them. Yes. And the police officers were from Britain, and the health inspector was from China. Wow. Wow. After that, I'm telling you, I was called a racist. Because I said on record, I said, what? You're bringing your foreigners to hunt us down, and you're coming with a Chinese virus? Get out. Yeah. It, took me, it took me 45 minutes. And don't you, don't you dare to give me I, your racist and white supremacist. That's what Antifa calls me. In my church, we have blacks, Jamaicans, we have Chinese, we have Asians, we have everyone. All colors, Americans, Indians. If the Martians were here, they would be welcome to come as well. Because you see, I don't care what is your color. You see, that's what Martin Luther King Jr. said. Yes. Yes. That he, he has a dream that one day people will judge other people not by what they possess, I'll paraphrase, not because of the color of their skin, but by their character. Yes. I'm not judging you by how you look or where you came from, but by your actions. Yes. You came here from China and you're bringing China to Canada? Get out. Get out. It took me 45 minutes. Eventually they go, only to come back a few weeks later, and they changed the tactics. And they had those big cameras with the big zooms. And they stood outside, and they took pictures of every woman and every child. Wow. That was their tactic. And we went over there to confront them, and we didn't know what to say except, are you pedophiles? Wow. Why are you taking pictures of our children? And behold, they got scared when we said that because they realized, oh, oh this is bad. Right, right. But I mean, seriously, why did I call them the Gestapo and KGB? Because when I grew up, that was the tactics of the communist right. Russians. If they couldn't kill you or didn't want to kill you, they would take a picture of your wife. Mm. And they would take a picture of your children. And they would send you those pictures. And they would say this to you. We may not kill you. We may even not arrest you, but we know where your wife is. We know where your children go to school. We'll go after them. That's exactly what the Canadian government is doing to us. They're using our women and children. You know, I have detectives coming to my house, giving me a $50 ticket. If you know anything about police policing, you know that the detectives are the highest paid police officers. In Calgary, they get double salaries, so they got $200,000. They are not there to deliver a bylaw ticket. Wow. That's a bylaw officer's job, the peace officer's job. But they would come with their flash badges to intimidate my wife and my children. They came with a purpose. You see? We're using every resource we can to come after you and your children. Yeah. Few weeks passed, and I thought maybe they will leave me be, and Easter came. And I didn't even think about locking the doors. The doors are open for all to come. And I turned my head to the left, and I looked, and I said, for a second, I looked at that woman, masked like a bandit. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, this is not for real. It took me about a second or two to register what was really going on. You see, I remember the time when you went to the bank, masked, you were arrested. <laughs> Now, if you go to the bank without the mask, you are arrested. It's incredible. It's incredible what happened within a very short period of time. So I've told them, get out. I started very politely. I said, please get out. They would not move. And you see, if you watch the video, you saw it took me a while to kick those devils out. Yeah. Get out, get out, get out. Finally, they go. They come back a few weeks later with the warrant, which was done secretly. My lawyer was never notified. I was never notified. The meeting was done by secret meeting. And they got that document that I can be arrested anywhere and that they have access to the wow. church anytime they want. So I said, OK, God, what? What now? What now? So they showed up again. And the only thing I could say to them is get out. <laughs> But that time, there was an international story, so I thought it's proper. It's a good reminder. 
and I continued preacher, uh, preaching. They came back 30 minutes after that, and my associate pastor that was arrested later on as well, he, was, he said the same thing, get out, <laughs> and they go. And they come back a few weeks later with a SWAT team. Anti-terrorists showed up. They opened the door, and people was packed house. And the people were yelling from the back, the Gestapo is here. I said, OK, I guess this is my day where I'm going to be dragged from the pulpit, just like the Russians did it, just like the Gestapo did it during the Nazi era. And I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that. But then they left. I was actually puzzled. I didn't know what's really going on. And then it turned out they dropped a package on the ground. They dropped something. I didn't know what. I kept preaching. They dropped something on the ground. It turned out there was another order by another judge that this is what the judge was giving them. That every person, it doesn't matter who, 4.6 million Albertans can be subjected to arrest if they defy the health inspector. A broad open, Joe Doe and Jane Doe, anyone. And they dropped that, but they didn't tell us. They didn't contact my lawyer. That order was done in secret again. What you know about the communists and the fascists, you know that everything was done unlawful, but lawfully according to them. Right. Adolf Hitler was democratically elected to be the chancellor of Germany. Every law he implemented was a lawful act according to his party. And we know, as I said, that Germans became the first victims of their laws. They left, and I was very happy that they did, because I don't want to be arrested. It's no fun. I've been arrested a dozen times, and I'm telling you, almost broke both of my arms. They threatened violence and all kinds of different things. It's no fun. But they left. So I finished preaching. I lay hands on the people. I prayed, and we had a good time. People left. And we started to drive home, and suddenly I look in the mirror, and here they are in the middle of a busy highway. And it's not just police. They're cowards. They could arrest me anywhere. They could come to the pulpit, and you know what to do? You want to do it, do it the Nazi style. Do it like a proper communist. But no, they waited for the people to go home, so I would be alone. Thank God I was there with my brother David and another friend of mine, Dave, that he could record the whole incident. They put us in a police vehicle. I said to them, when the officers came, one from the right, one from the left, and they said, you're under arrest for breaching a court order. I didn't know what kind of court order he's talking about. Later on, I learned it was that one that they dropped on the ground that was never read to me or given to me. I broke that one that I didn't know anything about. I went to my knees, I put my hands behind the back, and I said, you want to arrest me, arrest me, like the Nazis did. Be a good Nazi. And if you watch the video, you will notice that I was yelling at them, saying, shoot me, dad, taser me. I don't know if you remember that. I'll tell you why I said that, because he whispered to my ears. He says, I'm going to pin you with other charges, resisting arrest and assault. And that's why I said, taser me, shoot me, dad. They dragged me because we told them we're not going to cooperate with Gestapo. They dragged us, my brother to a different police vehicle and me. And they put me in the paddy wagon. And I'm telling you, it's a very short place, only for one inmate. And even that, it's stretching. But because they carried me, they placed me facing back on the floor. And my feet were sticking out. And they're trying to push my feet inside, but I'm just too big, too long. So the one officer looks at another and says, we're going to charge him with assault. <laughs> so now I got inciting people to come to church, opening the church, officiating a church service. Now I got resisting arrest and assault of a police officer. So I said, I'm in a big trouble. So I helped them to put my feet up, and the only way I could travel in that limo, it was my head on the ground and my feet up. I'm telling you, my hands were behind my back, handcuffed. This was the most painful encounter 
I ever had. If you have ever been arrested, the way they arrested me and the way they put my, the handcuffs on me and placing me with my whole body weight on the ground like this on top of my handcuff, hands, wrists, it was the most painful thing. I still to this day have a scar of that encounter. I don't know if you can see it. So imagine how that looked when they took the handcuffs off. They took me to the doctor because they thought it's broken. So they took us to a solitary confinement. We were for three days and two nights deprived of sleep. Every half hour, officer would come and would bang on the door to make sure that we cannot sleep. Eventually, we were taken to the judge. They put the chains on our feet, and the judge told them to release us, and they refused. They kept us seven more hours afterwards. Wow. And now we are facing probably a four years jail time for a contempt of court order for opening the church and for preaching the gospel. So this is your portion, America, if you will not wake up. This is your destiny if you're not going to stand up. Right now, we have this window of opportunity to push the evil away. Yeah. We have this moment in a history to remember what happened during the Nazi era when the Jewish people saw what was coming and they did nothing, yes. thinking to themselves, it's not that bad. I studied the history of the Jewish people during the Nazi, and that's exactly what they said. It's not that bad yet. I mean, yeah, they want us to wear a, a little thing on their sleeve, a Star of David. It's not that bad. I mean, they're not shooting us dead yet. Okay, it's, what's the big deal? Let's put that thing on our sleeves. And then, as you know the story, they were not allowed to go to the parks, just like we cannot go to the parks today unless you're vaccinated good dog or muzzled chihuahua. You cannot do things that normally every human being should be allowed to do. The German people could not go and walk on the sidewalk, you know that? They had to go in the middle of the road when a German man was going on the sidewalk. And then they were told, pack your belongings, leave your possessions, just like they want to do it right now. Do you know about the Great Reset? Yeah. The greatest elimination of the middle class, small and medium sized businesses in the history of humankind. Yeah. They tell you, they tell me that you will have nothing and you will be happy. Yeah. I grew up in a country like that and I'm telling you, I was not happy. <laughs> be careful. Be careful. Because if you're not vigilant, if, not, if you're not courageous, you're going to end up with nothing and you will not be happy just like we were not happy under the communists. They were telling the Jewish people that we have to relocate you for your own benefit and your own good. Have you heard those words lately? Yeah. All of this yeah. is for your own health. Yeah, All of this is for your own good. We're doing this for you. Why, why are you resisting? Why are you fighting us? We're doing this for you. We are eliminating you for you. We are murdering you for you. Because we love you so much. We are robbing you for you. For your own good. You have nothing, you will be happy. They took them to get us. And then we know what happened. And then they told them, we're going to relocate you to a good place, a nice place. Go to the train. Don't resist. Don't fight. Take your belongings. We'll take you to your new Palestine, to Israel. And they did. And they were told that after days of travel, they needed food, they needed water. They told them, just come for the shower. Remember your number where you're going to put your clothes. Just remember, OK, because on the other side, we're going to give you a good meal. And we're doing this all for your benefit, for your good. And we know that the showers never came. Cyclone B came. Death came. Concentration comes. Auschwitz-Birkenau, which I visit every year. That's what came. Do I want to scare you? I think if you're not scared, you are just not paying attention. Yeah. Because fear, fear of 
evil is a good thing. It's like the same way when you are walking in the middle of the highway, you should have a healthy fear of a semi-truck coming towards you. But the fear cannot overpower you. People are asking me a question, have you been afraid? Yes, sometimes I am afraid. I don't know what they're going to do to me. Of course. But I'm not going to allow that fear to cripple me. I'm not going to allow that fear to own me. I will not be a slave to fear. I would not be a slave to fear. True peace is not merely the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. We have to stand up for our nations. We have to stand up for the future. We have to stand up for our children. We have to stand up for our grandchildren while we still can do that. And we still can. So rise up, church. Rise up, people. Rise up, Americans. And fight this great evil together. Let's be, let's be like this courageous young girl. Let's be like Martin Luther King Jr., like Esther, Mordecai, the apostles of all, the prophets, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, that ends up in a lion's den and says to the king when he comes to visit him the next day, Daniel, are you still there? Did God rescue you from the mouth of the lions? And Daniel responded and said, Yes, a great king. The angel came and shut the mouth of the lions, and they did not hurt me. In the end of the day, we have that promise. The Bible says 365 times, do not be afraid, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. When the fear comes, God says, I am with you. Greater is he that is in you than the one that is in them. In the end, we know how the story ends. We know that in the end, it says, we win. Amen. God bless you. Check out FBCUnited.com. It will tell you how you can support the pastor not only on this tour but also um, to bring him back and then also um, in his legal fight against this tyrannical uh, overreach. That's like what I was trying to say. This is tyranny. Right, thank you. And thank you, Pastor Polowski, for your courageous faith. Thank you, Corbin, going on with FBC United. It's courageous faith. Thank you for standing up and being the lion. We need to have more lions in the church. So God bless you all. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, City Shapian. You guys, thank you. Uh, God bless you all. Let's keep fighting. Let's have our faith stand strong in it. And let's stand up and stand for America. Because if we fall, the rest of the world falls. Don't ever forget that. And God bless you all. Yeah.